recovering from a cold, as you can tell. Um, the advanced directive or living will is a description of what you want. So much more elaborate, might get more into end of life wishes, things like brain and body donation, versus the most serves as if you present to the emergency room or if you're in an assisted living facility and you require emergency care, do you or do you not want to move forward with these indicated interventions? So this is where I've broken things down into <coughs> disease stage. So we have um, early stage. These are some things that um, I, myself and then also my colleagues have discussed that are we find some valuable and actionable things to do in the early stages of the disease. So getting connected with your closest center of excellence or whatever um, care provider is nearest to you. Getting in touch with any resources and supports that they may have. Reviewing and putting into place the advanced directives, medical power of attorney, financial power of attorney, and living will. This presentation is specific to us at MedStar, but creating a patient portal for your medical network. So wherever you can access your medical records, start discussing and planning for end of life. And it's a very morbid topic. I think people are afraid to talk about it, but we all have to talk about it. Death it comes for us all eventually. And again, <clears throat> my big focus is the patient's right to self-determination, anyone's right to self-determination and being able to <clears throat> explain what it is that they want both in life and after death. So things like body donation, brain donation, all of that it's important to start discussing as early as possible. And then also consider engaging in research. Like I mentioned, <clears throat> getting connected with your closest COE and getting involved in research is something you can do in the early stages. Yes? Hey, um, <coughs> Medical PLA and the um, uh, durable public financial mm -hmm. uh, PLA is is it an irrevocable? These are irrevocable documents. So whoever you're picking, you pick more than one. Person. Yes. And um, so in some families, our family anyway, mm -hmm. you don't know if your sister is going to get Huntington's. So you might pick right. your sister, but then things can change. Yes, they can be changed and updated, and you can also pick more than one person. So typically, on a lot of documents. You might have to pick, <coughs> I'm so sorry everyone, the first, second, and third power of attorney. In that case, it's usually that if the first person listed is unavailable, whether they themselves don't have the capacity, say you've kept this document and 12, 15, 20 years has passed. If that first person is no longer able to act as decision maker, it moves to the next person. <coughs> it can't be like a code, so it can. So not necessarily. Typically, you have to pick one that is the ultimate decision maker. It doesn't mean that you can't collaboratively make decisions. Right. It just is that person will be then the figurehead for, say, you have to call the bank. Right. You have to go about it that way. Because sometimes people are out of town, but you would want to have somebody's closer, so you can do too. But... Yeah, and it, there's some variability. Again, in most states, <clears throat> for medical decision making, it goes by next of kin anyway. You don't have to go <clears throat> through a medical power of attorney, but in the absence of a medical power of attorney, so in some cases, your next of kin, maybe that's the absolute last person you want to make a decision for you, without a medical power of attorney, they have to go to next of kin. Yeah. And so if that person is the absolute last person you ever want making decisions for you, you need to have a document indicating who else the other person should be.